some isolated hotspots of food insufficiency in various districts, including Chikwawa, Sanje, Mangochi, Zomba, Lilongwe, Korakota, Garonga, Katabe. The Malawi Vulnerability Assessment Committee, MVAC, 2021 annual assessment projected over 1.6 million people to be food insecure during the 2021-2022 consumption year. However, government has already released about 17,000 metric tons of maize as humanitarian food to be distributed to the effect affected households while keeping art mark markets open for those who need to access more. Madam Speaker, notwithstanding our state of national food sufficiency, the second installment of the Affordable Inputs Program has suffered systemic disruptions and delays that justify our resolve to combine efforts to deliver the administration's key priorities with equally important efforts to fix the systems that affect the speed and quality of the public services we are delivering. That is why our interventions in the agricultural sector has gone beyond the rollout of programs like AIP and sought to also fix food systems that have either been neglected or sluggish for years. Toward that end, in the 2021-2022 financial year, government continued to implement the Chile Valley Transformation Project, SVTP, the Agriculture and Youth and Agribusiness Project, AIYAP, the Program for Rural Education Development under Pride Project, the Agricultural Commercialization Agcom Project, and the Affordable Inputs Program. Government will continue implementing these projects in 2022-23 financial year. Additionally, government will commence construction and rehabilitation of six smallholder solar-powered and gravity-fed irrigation schemes at Nkawinda in Blanta, Nazami in Deza, Kamwaz in Machinga, Chomboro in Chikwawa, Tikondane and Nolonga in Cholo district, covering a total of 690 hectares under Malawi Resilience and Disaster Recovery Management Project at a cost of 9.3 million US dollars. Madam Speaker, having given you an overview of the progress we have made towards the achievement of our priorities of wealth creation, job creation, and food security, allow me now to present highlights of the contributions made by various sectors towards the acceleration of our developmental agenda. I will focus on those sectors that create an enabling environment for development by improving productivity, human capital, governance, and partnerships. Sectoral performance in accelerating delivery of key priorities. This is my third part. Investing in productivity, industry and trade. Madam Speaker, my administration is facilitating the establishment of several industrial parks across the country in Nilongwe, Blantyre, Zuzu, and to achieve massive industrialization with feasibility studies already done for two of them. The total estimated investment is 956 million US dollars, which will result in the creation of at least 240,000 direct jobs. Apart from growing the country's export base, these industrial parks will provide a steady market for smallholder farmers. Our target is to have all processes done in time for construction to begin in December 2022. Madam Speaker, following the review of tax measures for manufacturing in the 2021-22 national budget, Manufacturers in the beverage sector increased their productive capacity through refurbishment of factories which were on the verge of collapse. New companies were also set up for the production of milk and yogurt, water, leather products, and juice. As our efforts to industrialize continue, 
Our desire is to support small scale processing and value addition activities by rural communities. In the 2021 22 financial year, government supported a number of projects in Mzuzu, Doam, Zimba, and Lilongwe by connecting them to the electricity grid, paying for the construction and installation works, and providing machinery. These rural factories have increased the wealth of 1,200 families and 1,000 entrepreneurs by 50% and created 15,000 permanent jobs. A total of 37 cooperative societies were registered during the year, engaged in various economic activities, while 53 potential groups were trained in readiness for registration. Going forward, in the 2022-23 financial year, government will develop regulations for operationalizing the zones, as well as develop and promote steel production initially using scrap metal. We will also organize an industrial endeavor for the manufacturing industry and establish an industrial research and innovation center. Madam Speaker, on the trade front, Malaya's trade in goods and services contributes 58% to GDP. Sadly, out of this, imports contribute 43.4% while exports contribute a paltry 14.6%, which is a trade deficit we are working to reverse. That deficit stood at 1.29 million US dollars by the third quarter of 2021. The main imports for Malawi are mineral fuels and oils, pharmaceutical products, machinery, vehicles, and fertilizers whereas the basket for main exports comprises the traditional commodities of tobacco, cane sugar, tea, and coffee, although oil seeds and edible nuts are becoming more prominent. Although Malawi has many market opportunities that can be exploited, its export markets are highly concentrated in two regions, namely the European Union at 36.5% of exports and Comesa and SADC region at 39%. It is therefore high time we also pursued emerging markets in Asia, especially India and China, which import 14% from Malawi, and the USA, currently importing 6%. In an effort to reverse the trend of perennial trade deficit, government launched the National Export Strategy too in December 2021, whose target is to increase exports to 20% of GDP from the current 14.6%. This will require the annual export growth rate to double to at least 5.6%. Madam Speaker, during the financial year 2021-2022, government signed memorandum of understanding MOUs with the Republic of South Sudan to access a market worth 295 US, a million US dollars and with the Indian government on export of pigeon peas to export 50,000 metric tons of pigeon peas annually for the next five years. Government also signed a reviewed bilateral trade agreement and an agreement on one stop border post, OSBP, with the Republic of Mozambique to promote and facilitate cross-border and transit trade at the borders between the two countries. Export deals of soya beans worth 157,684 metric tons, valued at 83 billion Malawi kwacha to various countries, including China, were also facilitated. Madam Speaker, Malawi attended the Intra-Africa Trade Fair IAFT in Durban, South Africa, in November 2021, where it recorded a 418.6 million US dollar worth of export inquiries from the region. Elsewhere, the Electric, an Egyptian multinational company, signed a memorandum of intent, MOI, to bring flagship investments to Malawi in various sectors worth 1 billion US dollars. Energy. Madam Speaker, productivity within our economy can only increase to the level that we are able to provide the energy for it. That is why in the energy sector, 
We set a target to add a further 1,000 megawatts to the grid from various sources by 2025. I'm happy to report that in the 2021-2022 financial year, the installed capacity of electricity rose from 364 megawatts to 617.1 megawatts. <laughs> Following the launch of Tajani 4 hydropower plant in which a $52 million grant from Japan and a $6 billion Malai Kwacha from Malai government were invested. JCM Solar PV project and Imloza Small Hydropower project constructed and operated by Cedar Energy Limited, a 26 megawatt biphase panel solar PV power plant in Deza, Golomoti, will also soon be launched which will bring us within less than 100 megawatts of meeting the current demand of 795 megawatts. On the back of these strides, ESCOM Limited has increased access to electricity from 11.4% to 12.4%. This is set to continue rising because my administration finished drafting the free electricity connection guidelines due for implementation next year. In the 2022-2023 financial year, government will continue implementing existing projects, including the 350 megawatt Paramanga hydropower project and the 200 megawatt Malawi Mozambique inner connector project. <laughs> Transport and public works. Madam Speaker, another factor that affects the productivity of any economy is the quality and quantity of its infrastructure. That is why the Malawi 2063 recognizes transport infrastructure as a key enabler for socioeconomic productivity. As you may recall, my last State of the Nation address already outlined a number of investments we are making in infrastructure development to boost economic productivity, including the following dualizing and rehabilitation Tating sections of M1 Road, upgrading Kenyatta Drive and Zimba Street to six lanes, rehabilitating the Sanjali Bwonde Road, constructing Cholo Tekerani Muona Makanga Road, upgrading the Ncheo Tsangano Neno Mwanza Road, upgrading the Sanja Marka Road, upgrading the Njakwa Livingstonia Road, upgrading the Jaleka Nchisim Palo Malomo Road, upgrading the Nsanama Nayuchi Road, upgrading the Nkanda Kapiri Road, Upgrading the Monkey Bay Cape Maclear Road, upgrading the Rumpinika Tipa Road, upgrading the Rilangwe Chingale Machinga Road, and constructing the Rural Bridge. Madam Speaker, in the 2022 2023 fiscal year, we will also re start rehabilitating the M5 road from Balaka Market to Kapatenga, Duangwa, and Katabe, which is a critical, which is a critical route for the sugar and rice plantations as well as tourist attractions along the lake, which with support from the African Development Bank. Other road investments include phase three and four of the Jenda Dinge Nimanyamulam Zimba Road and the Chikwawa Chapananga Mwanza Road. At the same time, we have invested in the feasibility studies of Mangochi Makanjia Road and the Dinge Neutin in Perembe Gumpi Road. And once those studies are completed, construction will begin. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I have stated before, our quest to fix broken systems in our land includes fixing the rail system. As such, during the 2022-2023 fiscal year, we will pursue the Mark Bangula section of the rail line following its failure to stop in the 2021-2022 fiscal year because of procurement issues, which is yet another example of state systems that are too broken to deliver development and need fixing. The same applies to the feasibility studies we were unable to do on the proposed rail line from Salima to Tanzania through the northern region. The studies failed because of a gap in the system. 
for the country has had no legal framework for a BOT model for implementing such a project. As such, we will use this year to fix that system by ensuring that the Public-Private Partnership Commission accelerates the development of that legal framework. Madam Speaker, in air transport, my administration has made provision for counterpart funding for the European Investment Bank financed construction of the Ordonchira Airport in Zuzu. <laughs> Financing for a feasibility study on the same has been provided. Financing for a visibility study on the same has been provided through a grant aid from the Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa, BADEA, and Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC. Investment, uh, or investing in human capital development. Madam Speaker, the priorities we are delivering and the systems we are determined to fix are for the benefit of Malawians. But what we have seen in delivering these benefits is that their impact can easily evaporate if the Malawian people themselves are not capacitated and empowered to steward and enjoy those benefits in a way that is sustainable. A new road can lose its benefit if citizens drive carelessly on it. A new hospital can lose its benefit if citizens steal medicines from it. A new vaccine can lose its impact if citizens believe conspiracies about it. A new school can lose its impact if citizens keep their daughters from attending it. A new election can lose its impact if citizens are kept misinformed about government matters. That is why part of fixing broken systems for delivering development priorities involves enhancing the physical, mental, and social capacity of our people. Health. Madam Speaker, our first target of investment in human capital development is the health sector, where the chief culprit for poor delivery of public service is a broken system we must fix. Toward that end, I am pleased to report the following progress. With financing from our taxpayers on the Global Fund, we have commenced the construction of a 55 out of the 100, 900 health posts I announced in September 2020. <laughs> well, the construction of 145 posts is set to start in the 2022-23 fiscal year. We have all but completed the Palombe District Hospital and have allocated funds to start the construction of the new Chikwawa District Hospital in the coming year, as well as conduct feasibility studies for new district hospitals in Rumpi and Doha. We have recapitalized Central Medical Stores Trust with 12.5 billion Malai Kwacha to prevent it from collapsing under the weight of areas worth 17.5 billion Malai Kwacha caused by abuse of the previous administration and we will continue clearing those bills in the coming fiscal year while also preventing future abuse by debarring suppliers who defraud government from doing any business with the central medical store. We will continue digitizing the entire health system a health supply chain under the Master Supply Chain Transformation Strategy 2021 to 2026. We will continue to fight against COVID-19 through the administration of around 1.5 million vaccine doses we expect to receive in the first quarter of 2022, building on the successful administration of 1,864,968 vaccine doses so far. We have reduced the number of hospitalized children due to severe and acute mal malnutrition to less than 1%. And we have added 1,246 health care workers to the workforce in our health facilities. 
education. Madam Speaker, our second target for human capital development is the education sector, where our efforts to build an empowered and responsible citizenry include the following. We will implement compulsory education for our primary school going children. We will increase the number of teachers and teaching and learning materials in response to expected increase in enrollment. We have constructed 851 classrooms to expand space for our primary school learners. We have accelerated the completion of the construction of the three teacher training colleges in Chikwawa, Rumpi, and Mjinji. We commenced the construction of 250 secondary schools under the Secondary Education Expansion Development Seed Project in partnership with the United States of America, as well as 308 classrooms, 120 teachers' houses, 60 student teachers' hostels, and 60 administration blocks in 60 teaching practice schools in partnership with Germany. We have committed to establish 34 secondary schools of excellence with Chikwawa, Palombe, Kodakota, Mango, Chililongwe, Rumpi, earmarked for the first six. We have delinked the old University of Malawi and are committed to provide the necessary infrastructure for the new public universities such as Luana's new administration block and teaching complex and the School of Economics, all due for completion in the 2022-2023 fiscal year while also constructing new buildings at the University of Malawi, at Kamuz University of Health Sciences, at Malawi University of Business and Applied Sciences, at Malawi University of Science and Technology, and at Mzuzu University. And we have partnered with the private sector to construct hostels in all public universities. Land and housing. Madam Speaker, our third target for human capital development is land and housing. Specifically, government is undertaking policy and legal reforms, including a review of the 2016 land laws as I direct in 2020. As a result, the land amendment bills are ready for tabling during this parliamentary meeting. More practically, Madam Speaker, to improve the investment climate and ease of doing business in the country. My administration will allocate 5,000 hectares of land to Malawi Investment and Trade Center, MITC, for allocation to investors over the next five years. Similarly, my administration is continuing the five-year project of constructing 10,000 houses for our security institutions, of which 231 in phase one are in progress. As houses for those who protect us are progressing, we are also building houses for those most in need of protection, such as persons with urbanism, the elderly, chronically ill, child-headed families, and female-headed families under the Social Housing Protection Program. Madam Speaker, one manifestation of a breakdown in systems for land management is the proliferation of uncoordinated and unplanned development. To address this system failure, my administration is designing the Land Information Management System, LIMS, as well as developing district development plans and urban structure plans. This includes Lake City plans that designate specific sections of land along the lake for major tourism investments. Information and digitalization. Madam Speaker, our fourth target for human capital development is the creation of an informed citizenry. To make progress in that direction, government developed the Access to Information Act, ATI, regulations in January 2021. As I speak, the ATI Act is being implemented in collaboration with the Malawi Human Rights Commission. Another initiative to increase access to information for Malawians is the provision of affordable internet services. To accomplish that, my administration successfully negotiated for the 75% reduction on the lower volume bundles and the pay-as-you-go, pay-go rates by Airtel Malawi PLC and TNM PLC. 
In the coming year, we will be implementing phase two of the National Fiber Backbone Project, which will further reduce data lending costs. <laughs> Madam Speaker, this coming year we will be pursuing a governance digitalization agenda with greater focus. Aside from adding digitalization to the portfolio of the Minister of Information, my administration just completed the installation of equipment for local area networks, lands, in 14 buildings at Capitol Hill. This is an addition to the National Data Center being constructed in the longer to harmonize all critical systems of MDAs. We have also earmarked 16 schools, two markets, two airports, and hospitals for free public Wi-Fi service. Gender, social welfare, and youth. Madam Speaker, our fifth target for building the capacity of our people is the empowerment of such different disenfranchised social groups as women, children, youth, and persons with disabilities. In pursuit of this, we have been addressing and will continue addressing system gaps in the social security of these important demographics. The following are some of the notable programs in this regard. We implemented the literacy program, women economic empowerment program, village savings and loans program, probation and rehabilitation program, and aiding child marriages initiatives. We disbursed for the two billion Malai Kwacha to 293,522 households in all 28 districts of the country, 70% of which benefited women to cushion marginalized groups against the lack of social needs, uh, basic needs in this harsh season of economic recovery. We intensified awareness campaigns against gender-based violence by training the police, magistrates, health and social workers throughout the 16 days of activism. We assisted a total of 587 learners with urbanism with protective equipment and school fees to continue their education safely across the country. We reintegrated 1,544 children from the streets to their respective homes and provided psychosocial support to 62,650 primary caregivers, parents, and community members. And we rescued 11,000 729 children from child marriage and provided psychosocial support to all of them. <laughs> Madam Speaker, let me conclude by mentioning two things that we cannot do without if we are going to succeed in either delivering our long-term priorities and diffusing our, <coughs> diffusing our short-term pressures or fixing the broken systems we need for that purpose. Firstly, we cannot do it without good governance. <laughs> fixing, fixing the governance system to deliver our ambitious developmental agenda is critical. Those fixes of the two governance we cannot win that fight unless the Anti-Corruption Bureau has the power and resources to investigate cases freely. In turn, the Anti-Corruption Bureau cannot succeed without a winning strategy for managing, prosecuting, and winning cases as directed by the Director of Public Prosecution. In turn, the public prosecutor cannot end corruption by prosecuting alone without our other supporting anti-corruption strategies from the office of the Attorney General. In turn, the Attorney General cannot enhance the drive against corruption if he is allowed to enter settlements out of court without a system of accountability, which is why my administration will be amending the Civil Procedures Act to establish a committee responsible for making recommendations to the Attorney General before settling claims above a certain threshold. In turn, the Attorney General cannot succeed in defending public resources against fraudulent settlement claims against government if the courts are compromised 
are not given enough funds to clear the backlog of cases going back decades. Madam Speaker, I mention these in our connections to demonstrate why our administration's fight against corruption and lawlessness has had a system-wide approach. I am therefore as proud of the successful investigations into corrupt acts as I am of the lawful arrests affected by the Malay Police Service, all of the hundreds of criminal cases our prosecutors have won, all the billions in taxes the Attorney General's office has saved by defending government in court, all the guilty verdicts the courts have handed down against corruption culprits. We will therefore continue this system-wide approach to fixing the governance system in the coming fiscal year, ensuring that no institution is hindered from fulfilling its constitutional mandate, nor operating in violation of the laws that regulate how its officers should work or relate to other institutions. And most importantly, the interconnections between all our government institutions is the reason why the only way to fix our broken system is to, ap to apply public sector reforms to the whole apparatus, not just parts of it. That is why during the 2021-2022 fiscal year, I tasked the past president, the right honorable Dr. South Klaus Chilima, to form a task force and recommend how our government systems can be fixed. Going into 2022-2023, A decision in the boardroom of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund affects us. A criminal investigation in another country affects us. A global economic summit we are not invited to affects us. A careless post on social media by a foreigner misinformed about vaccines affects us. Because of the deep historical, geographical, cultural, political, economic and digital ties between us and other nations, harnessing partnerships with nations that have goodwill towards us is critical to the achievement of our priorities and the fixing of the systems we need for delivering them. For this reason, my administration's foreign policy in the year under review was focused on development diplomacy and that will continue to be the case in the coming fiscal year. I wish to single out the support that our development partners continue to give towards our efforts to preserve and conserve the environment. It has enabled us to implement the commitments made at the Climate Change Conference. It has enabled us to establish the National Climate Change Fund. It has enabled us to implement policies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It has enabled us to better manage forest resources, including the planting of 45 million trees of different species. It has enabled us to operationalize the Malawi Environment Protection Authority, MEPA, to enhance enforcement of and compliance with environmental protection laws. In short, the international support we have received and hope to continue receiving is a key ingredient to the sustainability of our development. The same is true for the overwhelming support we have received from our development partners, both in cash and in kind, for the relief of our people in the last year, who are reeling from the devastation caused by Tropical Storm Anna. Such relief gives us hope 
that once the storm is over, we have enough friends to help us get back on track with our national development. So whether our partnerships are with nations in the Americas, or Europe, or Africa, or Asia, whether our partnerships are through trade deals, or diplomatic missions, or investment MOUs, or direct budget support, our cultural exchange programs, or academic scholarships, whether our partnerships are in the provision of COVID-19 supplies and vaccines through COVAX, or in bringing